This is Need to Know. Real talk about the reality of unidentified aerial phenomena. From Australia, Ross Coltart. From the US, Bryce Zabel. Well, what a momentous two weeks it's been since the release of the UAP report to Congress. I'm so excited about this week's show because we've got so much to cover. Enter Bryce Sable. How are you, mate? I'm very good, Roscoe. Great to see you again. It has been too long. You know, the big story, though, that everybody's been talking about for the last week has been this Chinese balloon story, and we're going to dig into that in a moment. But, you know, there's also that story of the continuing legacy media that sort of refuses to take this thing seriously and uh, do the real investigation work that they ought to be doing. So I guess that's why we have to do it. Although it does seem odd, the Department of Defense still keeps trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube, and and some of the media keeps eating that up. We also have a new book uh, from Jacques Vallée that really has some explosive comments on it, particularly dealing with the Wilson Davis memo. So I'm looking forward to that one too. And We've also got a new case from uh, a nuclear plant to talk about, and we've got reports of those metal balls. That's right, the ones that fly, that Gary Nolan is testing, that are up there at 25,000 feet in a lot of videos. We're going to talk about that. So it's a lot, Ross. It really is. Over to you. Take it away. Okay, let's deal with it. Holman Jenkins at the Wall Street Journal has been at it again, my friend. Just this morning on the Wall Street Journal, He's basically suggested that the entire UAP UFO story has all been an attempt at misdirection, at some kind of disinformation by the United States to distract attention from the fact that they've known all along about these Chinese balloons flying across US aerospace. It's just the kind of comfortable story that you would expect a Pentagon national security correspondent to publish in an eminent newspaper to allay public concern. And he says quite pompously in his article this morning, for those who couldn't figure out why I devoted four columns to the Pentagon UFO debate, this is why. It became clear that whether from serendipity or design, national security agencies were using UFOs to hide something they didn't want us to see. That something it has slowly dribbled out since last May was Chinese surveillance in US airspace. This is a real reds under the bed one, Bryce. It was all the Chinese. Let's pack up and go home and forget about UAPs. What do you reckon? Well, you know, I reckon that I resent this story on a couple of levels. The first is when you told me, hey, you got to read this this thing. I went to read it on the Wall Street Journal site. And of course, I had to join them to read their, you know, go through their paywall to read it. Then when I read it, I see this story that's just, you know, it's full of those loaded words like, I mean, here's a phrase, the fluffing of the UFO misdirection. Boy, that's a loaded phrase. The UFO snow job. I mean, it's just bit after bit like that in this thing. And, you know, he's just wrong. He's he's literally either taking direction from somebody or he's not as smart as he thinks he is. But this is really not a very accurate way to take a look at this uh, this Chinese balloon story, which we we need to get into. I mean, it's been amazing, hasn't it, to be following a balloon that, uh, at best I know, started in Montana, slowly drifted across the United States while well, everyone talked about it, ended up off the coast of South Carolina, where we finally shot it down and have uh, done our our sea rescue of it and confirmed, as I understand it, that it isn't the little weather balloon that they were talking about in the Chinese media but and the government, but it is actually a surveillance balloon of some kind. You know the real story behind all of this, Bryce? The media has gone into a frenzy about a Chinese surveillance balloon that's clearly some kind of spy balloon. And everybody's, you know, rattling the saber about it. You've got all the right-wing politicians having a good old go at Biden for failing to protect national security. And yet the real issue, well, there's two big issues here. One is we've still got unresolved mystery of incursions by objects detected on radar and other sensor systems which are doing crazy things with US military in different military zones off the western east coast of America, and more importantly, in war zones in the Middle East. 
These are serious incursions which have gone largely unacknowledged by the mainstream media, almost a willful blindness to the fact that, you know, we're not going to give attention to the fact that the military itself, pilots are going on the record saying that they're seeing these objects. That's the first issue. And then the second issue that's come out of this, and Chris Mellon, the former Deputy Assistant uh, Undersecretary for Defence, he's talked about how the filter systems that the American NORAD monitoring systems have in place, until very recently, have not been looking for anything else other than ICBMs and cruise missiles. So the US is so focused on worrying, quite importantly, of course, about the risk of foreign enemy attack from, say, North Korea, China, or Russia, it's not looking, it's not focusing on the anomalies that are being picked up by their system. And I think it's been overlooked that Chris Mellon has actually pointed out that their filters that have been in operation in NORAD failed to pick these up at the first point of call. And it's only because we've now got UAP anomaly detection systems being put in place as a result of Congress's intercession that we're now picking up these things. So this is actually the story of the Chinese balloon story is more about the huge chasm of ignorance about the fact that we've got these ongoing incursions in military airspace. But more importantly, the only reason these Chinese balloons are being picked up is because of the mandate that Congress has demanded to start identifying unidentified anomalous phenomena. You know, just to pick up on the Christopher Mellon thing for a moment, he also said that if these uh, balloons and so forth he was talking about, he said, if these are Chinese tech, then we're in serious trouble. Because, you know, let's face it. These giant uh, satellite, I mean, these giant surveillance and or weather balloons drift kind of with the, the tide there. They're in the air and they're drifting along. They, they can move, but not, not a 10,000 miles an hour. And they don't go from 80,000 feet to sea level. And they don't do a lot of the so-called impossible kind of physics things that some of these uh, uh, UAP objects have done. So it is kind of a weird thing to say we're going to explain it all as balloons, but it's not unusual. I mean, I, I, one of the things I like to do on this show, Ross, is to talk a little bit about like, well, we've seen this show before. And let's face it, folks, the balloon show started in 1947 uh, when uh, the, the U.S. government admitted that they had possession of a flying disc in Roswell. And then within hours said, no, no, nothing to see here. It was a weather balloon. So listen, we've been doing the weather balloon dance for as long, well, longer than I've been alive. It's been happening. And, and I think that what's strange is that we're going back to that playbook again. And for me, the playbook just doesn't wash. It's not, uh, it's not good physics to think that these things that were supposed to, that, that can all be explained as, oh yeah, well, it's just a balloon. It's not just a balloon. And frankly, it isn't just a Chinese drone because again, the Chinese didn't have drones in 1947 and in the fifties when we saw these things. So, okay. I'm done. I say this every episode, but I feel like I have to. It's just too crazy what they're trying to run past us. Now, look, as well as putting Holman Jenkins from the Wall Street Journal in the naughty corner with a dunce cap for his absurd attempts to describe the, all these UAPs as Chinese balloons, we've had a plague of, U of UFO Chinese balloons for the last 70 years. I also want to give dishonorable mention to Julian Barnes yet again from the New York Times. And he did a story where he's basically, I think, left readers of the New York Times with the very clear impression that the UAPs on the west and east coast of the US that have been the subject of many military sightings, quite disturbing incursions by objects doing very, very weird things. He's trying to suggest or leave his readers with the impression that these, these can now be explained as Chinese incursions as well. So he's doing the same thing as the Wall Street Journal. What an astonishing coincidence, Bryce, that the national security correspondent for the New York Times and oh gosh, just down the road, the Wall Street Journal. How could they possibly be saying the same thing? Do you think perhaps they're talking to the same people who are desperate to try and hose down the UAP issue? It sure seems to me they're being spoon-fed something. 
And, you know, I, I think we need to make clear to our listeners and viewers, we're not saying there aren't Chinese drones out there. And there certainly are Chinese uh, surveillance balloons. Those things exist. They do not, however, explain the actual UAP phenom that we're actually seeing. So, for example, that uh, report that was supposed to come out in 2022, but came out last month in our last and we talked about in our last show, to the best of my knowledge, I think they said there were 171 uh, sightings since the last report that were in the unexplained category. And uh, they'd already come up with a weather balloon and weather balloon like entities or a balloon like entities as a category. So those 171 are still unexplained. And I guess uh, just to kind of talk about that report and um, uh, with one look at the hindsight of the whole thing, it is kind of strange that uh, a, a report has come out that lists only the uh, statistics, but none of the details. We don't know anything about these 171 because the people that collect the data, the U.S. government, haven't shared it. We don't know uh, whether these were in the air, in space, underwater. We don't know how fast they went. We don't know if they went transmedium. Uh, we're not being shared any of that. So I think uh, my position on the, uh, the the government report that came out the, uh, last month is the more I sit with it, the, the more I think it's just insufficient. Um, again, nobody is expecting any government to sort of lay everything they know out uh, without classifying some of it or creating a national security reason not to do it. On the other hand, uh, what we're getting is barely not even minimally acceptable. And, and, and hopefully in future reports, we're going to hear a little more detail. Now, I want to drill down just a little bit into what's going on here, Bryce, because yeah. I, I think the public either by mistake by the Pentagon, or I suspect, I dread to suggest this, intentionally are being misled. Let's go back to what was being said to Congress uh, pretty much this time last year when the two intelligence officials, Ron Moultrie and Scott Bray, suggested that the objects that were being seen off the coast, the west coast of America, were drones. Do you remember that drones line that they came up with? And they suggested mm. that these objects were possibly Chinese foreign drones that were pestering US Navy ships 30 to 50 miles out to sea, multiple ships being buzzed by dozens of drones at one time in an area that had a radius of, I think, about 100 square miles. Now, there's been some interesting response, rejoinders from our friends Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp in recent weeks. Some of the witnesses are anonymous, but one of them is a guy called um, John Guts Guterres, who's a serving active duty Navy commander. And I think we should give credit where credit's due here. Corbell and Knapp have got quite a good scoop here, because not only did Guts Guterres acknowledge that there is a genuine concern by pilots about these anomalous objects that are being seen, he then went into some of the detail of what he's personally aware of himself and also from witnesses. And he basically revealed that. Um, Sailors from the USS Russell, for example, were following one of these UFOs as it traveled around the ship before it dramatically shot up straight up into the air without making any sound. There was also an anonymous eyewitness from the USS Paul Hamilton who described how one object shot down a bright white beam of light, illuminating the ship for two seconds. Quote, it went from pitch black to very illuminated very quickly. It was ish a jarring and shocking event. Um, Guts Guterres, who's spoken with sailors from the USS Paul Hamilton, explained how crew members told him it was as bright as day due to the strength of the beam. Now, my friend, that doesn't sound like any conceivable drone technology, or let's deal with it, balloon technology that's within current technology. Seriously. And, and frankly, if it, we thought it was actually Chinese balloon or surveillance technology, uh, you'd have to wonder why we didn't try to shoot it down overseas if it's interfering with our own stuff. Which this is, is the thing. This, this is the this is the thing that is, I think, the glaring lapse by the Congress is that they had the opportunity to cross examine these two intelligence officials, and frankly, I think they were so cowed by the explanation of drones, and now the latest one is balloons, 
they're so easily confused. And I, I think a good politician, a good questioner should have rejoined it and basically said, hang on a moment. These are objects that are doing things that are completely outside known technology of drones. They're 50 miles out to sea, dozens of them buzzing a ship. And I think the other thing that came through in the Corbell Knapp analysis was the explanation that the Congress and the public were led to believe was that it was a passing cargo vessel, the USS Bass Strait, from which these supposed drones were deployed. Well, it turns out that the witnesses interviewed by Corbell and Knapp on their Weaponized podcast say they saw no such deployment of drones either to or from the Bass Strait towards the US vessels. This is still a genuine mystery. So the big question in my mind is why? Why is the US military and intelligence services trying to lead the public by the nose with tame stories in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times and other publications to lead them to the completely false impression that these objects can be explained as Chinese drones or Chinese balloons? This is where Congress needs to start drilling down. It, not only do they need to do well, first of all, I'm very skeptical. I, I can't speculate too much about why they're doing that, other than the fact I don't think it'll work. To that, I do want to uh, do a shout out because uh, you brought them up and they've done such good work to our friends, uh, uh, George Knapp and Jeremy Corbell, who have a new, uh, since we were last on, I guess they have a new podcast of their own called Weaponized. It's very good. They've been doing a lot of great work. And it's funny, I was watching it, Ross, and one of the things is they at least to get get to sit on a set together. We're still doing this uh, between Australia <laughs> and the U.S., so that was interesting. And it's funny, as I was watching them, one of my family members came through. I'm watching on this uh, this screen here, and I said, well, what do you think? And my family member said that uh, they looked at Jeremy, and they said, he looks like a character from Sons of Anarchy, which I thought was very funny. <laughs> he he does had his rich jeans and his tats, and they said George Knapp looked like the silver-haired Johnny Cash in white sneakers, which I also enjoyed. And I, I say this not to make fun of them because our own fans tell us that you look like Vladimir Putin and I look like <laughs> Edward Norton after a very tough year. So we're all, we all get it. I'm very happy that they've got this podcast. I'm also uh, doing a shout out to Ryan Graves, uh, the F-18 pilot who now has a podcast called um, Merged. I think it's called Merged. And uh, they're both good. And he's talking to pilots about this. So there's a lot of good information. One of the things we want to do with new Need to Know, of course, is to uh, actually discuss what's out there and, and to track what other people are saying and, and to sort of raise the level. So we're happy to acknowledge them. Uh, they're friends. And, and we've put them and we've and actually in the documentary we did last year, both Jeremy Corbell and Ryan Graves were on that show. Okay, with the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times and the Pentagon and intelligence services eviscerated, gutted and disemboweled, let's move on, my friend. Yeah. Let's talk about Jacques Vallée's incredible yes. new diary release, The Forbidden Silent, Sire, start again, Forbidden Science, Volume 5. Jacques Vallée is like the godfather, the grandfather of UFO, UAP research, one of the most respected guys in the field. He's a, a Frenchman, emigrated to the United States, became a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, um, just a brilliant man, and has written many, many books on the UAP subject. And his one of his most coveted books is is the ongoing release of his diaries and all of us it's like waiting for the entrails of the the, mm. the hades you know you're sitting there trying to read the entrails reading what it was that jacques was talking about 20 years ago and this is this is the latest version volume five of his forbidden science is just extraordinary mm. because if even half of it is true it not only validates the legitimacy of the Admiral Tom Wilson memo, the Wilson Davis notes, it suggests very, very strongly that Jacques Vallée, Hal Putoff, Eric Davis, all the old favourites were 20 years ago definitely investigating a crash retrieval mystery inside the US government and that they had confirmation provided to them by sources that there were hidden in corporate aerospace projects involving the retrieval and back engineering of, drumroll, recovered alien technology. Incredible stuff. 
it is incredible stuff. And the sourcing is very interesting. I mean, we, obviously the uh, Wilson Davis memo, such as it's been called, uh, has people that have criticized it as people that are strong believers of it. But uh, I think uh, we both agree that as time has gone on, there seem to be more and more pieces that seem to fall into place about people who corroborate one part or another. And certainly Jacques Vallée in his uh, his fifth installment of his Forbidden Science has really uh, gone further down that uh you know, into that area where he's talked about the people who told him things and what they specifically said. It's really quite a read. And, and again, here we are talking about Chinese balloons and whether they're weather balloons or surveillance balloons. And here's a guy 20 years ago who is being told by insiders with, with important government positions who are incredible scientists and or military people all talking about crash retrievals. So I still think we may come this year and next year to the ultimate uh, uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, which is some kind of confirmation that we in fact do have some kind of exotic technology. I wanted to ask you a question though about that. Rod okay, go ahead. Sounds like you've got something to throw in there. Go ahead. Well, I, I thought for the uh, the people in our audience who aren't familiar with the Wilson Davis notes, I'll just do a quick process yes. and the reason why they matter. So it's part of UAP mythology that a physicist by the name of Dr. Eric Davis, who now works for the um, federally funded research development corporation, the Aerospace Corporation, before he was working there, he was working for um, Bigelow, Robert Bigelow, and working in collusion with Hal Putoff from the National Institute of Discovery Science. And back 20 years ago, they were looking very, very seriously at rumours that the United States government had indeed recovered non-human technology, craft, alien spaceships, unbelievable stuff. And there was a guy called Admiral Tom Wilson, who was the immediate past boss of the Defence Intelligence Agency, who categorically denies that this conversation ever took place. But <laughs> these notes from, from Jacques Vallée's diaries make it very, very clear that Jacques Vallée believes that the meeting did take place. Basically, there's a memo of a conversation that took place between Eric Davis and Admiral Tom Wilson, where Tom Wilson allegedly described to Eric Davis in astonishing detail his efforts to get to the bottom of a hidden UFO crash retrieval program being reverse engineered inside private aerospace with the connivance and knowledge of only a few select people in the defense and intelligence services in the US government. It all seemed like a wacky conspiracy theory, the kind of deluded tinfoil hat nonsense that ufologists often get taken to pieces on. But when you read the Forbidden Science Diaries, by golly, Bryce, you know, there's 8th of May, 2000, Jacques writes about the revelations of a former TRW employee. An attorney friend of hers has gathered her testimony. She was part of a secret reverse engineering project called Zodiac. I mean, this is amazing because it's Zodiac. Amazing. It's amazing. And it kind of hits home for me. Um, I have a brother. I have just one sibling, uh, a brother who was a TRW employee for many years and has retired now. And when I was doing Dark Skies, I remember uh, kidding him and saying, hey, I know what you're up to. You're doing that reverse engineering project on on the saucers. And I was just kidding because it was the show I was working on. And he shut me down pretty quickly. He said, please don't ever talk to me that way again. Wow. So we never had well, that conversation again. I'll the other thing I liked about reading all these things, because this, this literally is like reading somebody's diary, except it's about UFO crash retrievals and so forth. Sure. So it's crazy stuff to read. But a one, one of the things he said is um, Eric, and he's talking about Eric Davis, has been told there are 10 velo bound volumes at Wright Pat with Roswell data concerning two crashed, quote, manta ray shaped craft recovered bodies, foil type material, and a special study by TRW. And wow. I mean, you know, Jacques Vallée is a guy that's tried to maintain a very circumspect, rational approach to this whole topic over his career. And he's done a, a terrific job with that. He, he doesn't jump to conclusions lightly. He doesn't uh, suffer fools easily. And he, he tries to tell it like it is. So 
for him to be putting out this, uh, it's, it, it gets to you. One of my favorite lines is when John Alexander, Colonel John Alexander, talks to um, uh, Jacques Vallée about a form of secret access called Blue Border, which can get people killed. <laughs> I love this stuff. You know, it's amazing. You know, are there really people in private aerospace or in dark corners in the US intelligence and defense services who are going around whacking people with knowledge of the UFO crash retrieval program? Seems and as you say, yeah, That's I mean, it's amazing. Saying. But then it's the, the really good detail in the diary is the names. For example, a lot of the names, Pete Aldridge, who's got responsibility for matters relating to DOD acquisition, R&D, logistics, advanced te technology. Um, he, uh, there's a guy called Bernard Haish, who's a researcher, and he cites how Pete Aldridge had responsibility, presumably for the crash retrieval program, and, but he now thinks there are four projects, not just one, distributed among contractor facilities. They have the hardware from Roswell. One of his sources is NASA engineer Larry Lemke. So there's all these names coming forward. And basically, there's a description from a General Sheehan, Sheehan. when he's shown Sheehan when yeah. he's shown the MJ-12 documents, which I'm sure you'll love, Bryce. And he says that... He, he told the story of his boss instructing him to take a flight to a certain facility where he, quote, touched a craft. I mean, this is cool stuff. Well, you know, it uh, it's funny that you, you say, well, this you'll appreciate the majestic thing. Uh, I think what, what people should know, what Ross is referring to is that in uh, the 80s, there were documents released or leaked, if you will, somehow that purported to be a briefing memo created for President Dwight Eisenhower when he was coming into office. And this so-called briefing memo detailed uh, basically the Roswell crash and a few other things. And um, what was interesting about it is I took that and ran with it in the 90s and made this television series, Dark Skies, where the the main set was the Majestic 12 set. Now, of course, over the years, people have said, well, those Majestic 12 documents, they can't be real. The FBI called them bogus, um, and, and people have said they, they had to be disinformation. Uh, the thing is, here's people in writing taking Majestic 12 seriously. So, Ross, the question I have is, what are we to believe here? Are, is, is it possible that Majestic 12, MJ-12, magic, whatever you want to call it, um, isn't just a giant disinformation thing, but it might actually have existed. Well, let's just look at what this what could be done. Let's let's just proactively think about what could be done here to investigate this. And this is where Congress and ARO, the uh, Pentagon's UFO investigation body, this is where the inquiries could start. So Jacques' diary names Jack Sheehan. John right. Joseph Jack Sheehan, born 1940, is still alive. He's 82 years old. He's a retired U.S. Marine Corps general. He's the former Supreme Allied Commander Atlantic for NATO, and he was Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Atlantic Command. This is the bee's knees, a top Pentagon general who is describing, allegedly, he was, he was told to take a flight to a certain facility Jacques Vallée says, presumably a Lockheed site, where he saw and touched a craft. Now, frankly, Bryce, if Congress does not call under subpoena John Jack Sheehan and demand that he answer truthfully under oath, they are not doing their job. Well, yes. And Ross, you've made a point that we've made before, and I think it bears making again, which is there is a way to get these answers. You start bringing people in um, and making them testify. And then you check their testimony out against the facts as you know them and you start getting documents. And if we really, really wanted to get to the bottom of this, we could, we could do it. And the question I have is, since we're only getting that little bit of this data currently in these reports we're getting, because we are only getting the unclassified report, do you think these classified reports that they're getting in Congress have 
more of that kind of stuff? Do you think Sheehan and other people actually are being um, talked to? And I and and hold that thought for one second. I just want one thing clear to people. You may have heard the name Danny Sheehan before. Not the same person. Danny Sheehan is uh, someone who's been involved in the political scene in Washington, and he's also involved in the UFO scene. He is not related and is not the general Jack Sheehan that we're talking about here. Okay, what do I think? Well, okay, I, I am told that there are people who purport to have knowledge of the program who have given and will be giving inf evidence to Congress. I don't think Jack Sheehan's been approached. Um, I don't think Bobby Inman's been approached. I see no evidence that the uh, Congress has yet... I mean, are they? do they have the balls to bring senior Pentagon officials that might have been involved in a, a, essentially a criminal cover-up? Do they have the balls to bring these people to Washington and put them under oath? That's the big question. But here we have in a diary exactly 20 years ago, Jacques Vallée saying, quote, Sheehan seemed disturbed at the absence of oversight, presumably of the reverse engineering program. Private industry is completely in charge, he reportedly said, which raises the question, could the projects in question be using Defence Intelligence Agency money without oversight or even knowledge? He also said he would honour his secrecy oath and not reveal more, but he did acknowledge that he found a nine billion dollar discrepancy in some budgets which led him to uncover the project so this is a separate defense official from admiral tom wilson saying that he investigated and he tells either jacques valet or bernard Haish that he found a secret program inside the pentagon inside the intelligence services which is recovering alien technology now you can call us tinfoil hat crazies as much as you like bryce but when you have evidence like this this is called evidence this is admissible yes. in a court of law i'm an attorney i'm a trained attorney i know what i'm talking about this is not hearsay this is somebody who's told a witness this and it's been passed on to jacques valet this would be tenderable in a court if the congress is not asking for this evidence and demanding that these witnesses be deposed under oath they're not doing their Very job good. You know, and, and misplacing $9 billion. I don't know about you, Ross, but when my wife and I try to balance the checkbook at the end of the month and we're off by $3.72, we spend hours trying to figure that out. So when you misplace $9 billion, uh, I think you got to look into that and figure out what's going on. The other thing I noticed about the the, the book, and I do encourage people, uh, you know, we can only touch the highlights, but the book is, is fascinating because it's a different kind of thing from Jacques. But what I thought was interesting is Jacques has distinguished himself with his research and, and opinions and conclusions and books over the years for being the guy that wasn't going to go into the nuts and bolts, that he thought that there was something uh, a little more paranormal going on that could explain this, that it couldn't just simply be somebody from another planetary system has shown up here and, and is flying spacecraft around. So for him to actually be talking about the craft and uh, going to touch a craft and, and uh, reverse engineering is kind of a departure in some respects, but it does show what he was being told. And, um, you know, recently, uh, just this last week, I've been rereading John Keel's wonderful book, um, Operation Trojan Horse. And um, I think it is kind of intriguing because he is sort of the, 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 the ancestor, if you will, of the Jacques Vallée uh, take that there's got to be something else going on that may be far weirder than we can even imagine. And um, so I just feel like we are still circling an answer because every once in a while we go, oh my God, it's got to be nuts and bolts. And then other times we hear things and we say, well, wow, nuts and bolts wouldn't explain that one. What exactly are we talking about? So I feel like we're just starting to get this onion peeled a little bit. And when we finally get a few more layers off, uh, you know, literally strap yourself in, put your seatbelt on and, and we're going to go on a rocket ship ride. It's going to be crazy. So I think we should keep on moving on, but I, I think we yeah. should put it on record here for this program that, that the validity of the Admiral Wilson memo, the Eric Davis Wilson memo notes, is now beyond question because Jacques Vallée actually reports in his diary 
that he's aware that Tom Wilson, the Admiral, went to the Special Access Program Oversight Committee and raised hell. He was livid about the lack of oversight, and he told Eric Davis that he was told that if he didn't drop it, he'd lose two stars and would never be the DIA director. And it's really interesting because I've seen the, the Admiral Wilson memo, and that is exactly what the memo says. And then Eric, uh, Admiral Wilson told me that he went on and became uh, an executive at ATK Missiles in Minnesota. And this is what the diary records. It says that Eric's been told by Admiral Wilson that he's taking over as president of ATK Missiles at um, Edina, Minnesota. He's being polygraphed and may be concerned to be accused of unknowingly leaking privileged information. So it, it basically underlines that Admiral Tom Wilson is a decent man, that he's doing his level best to try and get this story out to good people. Somebody like Eric Davis with a security classification, he's not leaking this out the national security infrastructure. He's raising concerns that this is a, a program which is possibly operating illegally, possibly criminal, without congressional oversight. 20 years ago, this is being raised. Right. And here we are 20 years later, and Congress is now just starting to get the momentum to start asking questions about this. This really matters because one of the things that comes through in Jacques Diaries is the allegation that the program was inside the government at some point, but under Nixon, President Nixon, right. it got transferred to a private contractor in order to secure it. Now, this is what Congress is investigating. This is why the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, shouldn't be deluding themselves with the red herrings that are being fed their way about Chinese balloons. They need to start engaging with this issue because this is what this is, is the story of a chronic failure of legacy media. Mainstream media in America have completely dropped the ball on investigating this issue. And frankly, it's because the national security defense correspondents are shills to the Pentagon PR people. They're, they're far too supplicant, far too obedient, because they know that if they rock the boat by asking questions about this stuff, they're going to get smacked. They're going to get cut off from the information flows. And this is where Congress needs to cut through. And this is where aggressive media questioning needs to begin. It's absolutely vital. Someday, and probably it won't be you and I writing this, but someday historians are going to be looking back on this period. In fact, the whole last 80 years, but in particular this area, and they're going to be trying to make sense of this. How is it that a secret of this magnitude was possibly kept all these years. Who were the people that that didn't do their jobs? Was it just was it, it could include suspects like academia? Uh, it could include uh, the the legacy media. It includes the, the. I mean, let's face it. We've got the same argument going on right now. Twenty years ago, uh, Jacques Vallée is being told about crash wreckage, and here we are, twenty years later, and we're still trotting out the balloon stories. So. Uh, it's going to be a story just about not just what the truth is, but how the truth was prevented from being widely circulated among the population of this planet. Something that is just, um, it's not good. It's not been a, it's not been our finest chapter. Now, speaking about issues that continue to bubble along and consistently get ignored by the mainstream media, I recently tweeted about an incident that allegedly happened in December last year involving a, a triangular UAP that was seen over a Pennsylvania nuclear power station at a place called Limerick. And uh, we basically reported that a, a, a witness at Pottstown, the nearby village, reported seeing a silent triangle-shaped object with three dim orange lights slowly mo moving towards the Limerick generating station at late at night, about 9.40 p.m. on December the 9th last year. Now, this is a very typical story. I mean, our friend Robert Hastings, the author of that fantastic mm -hmm. book, UFOs and Nukes, has reported how ICBM sites all over the United States, nuclear power stations, nuclear processing centers, bomb-making centers all over the U.S. and indeed places around the world have been visited by craft. So I thought this was interesting because, yet again, apart from a report in the local newspaper, not picked up by mainstream media. And I got a very, very interesting letter. 
a lovely man called Nick Shaw contacted me and he told me that he had seen an identical object. And I think we've got a photograph here, Bryce. Uh, while I'm talking about this sighting, we can put it up on screen. He told me that in late January 2019, his wife Anna and his daughter Olivia were heading out for dinner at a local restaurant uh, in Pennsylvania. Um, they, they noticed about a mile away, three very bright white lights on the horizon, way too low to be a plane, wasn't moving particularly fast. As he got closer, the light started to dim, became an orange glow. He was right underneath it, driving. It was approximately 100 feet in the air. It was a triangle boomerang shape. It had three lights at the points of the triangle, approximately 80 feet in length. He put his window down as he's driving underneath it, and there's no sound whatsoever. At this point, the lights go from orange to light blue, and it starts moving backwards like it's following us. Nick's wife is so freaked out, she starts yelling at him to get away from it. He's fascinated, but he didn't want to scare his eight-year-old daughter. And then as he's driving away, he noticed in the different distance two more exact triangles in the sky, approximately half a mile from each other. Now, I spoke to Nick and I said, do you mind if I name you? Because it does help give credibility to your sighting. And he said, yes. And, and like a lot of people, he said, why should people feel embarrassed or ashamed about talking about this stuff? It's important that people come forward with this evidence. So that's just one sighting over a nuclear facility that, frankly, is another mystery, but it's got that's corroboration. One mystery after another. By the way, I'm not, I don't think we have a photo. I think we have some artwork on this thing, and I'll make sure that uh, the, the, those will be in the video version of this thing for those of you who are listening. Um, also, something that I thought was really interesting, you're talking about the connection between UFOs and nukes and uh, Hastings' book. Well, the most famous case, the one that has been talked about over and over, is the one that happened at Malmstrom Air Force Base, I believe, in 1967. And that's the one that uh, Robert Salas has testified about. And it's a really good case. Uh, and I won't belabor it here. You can look it up, frankly, Malmstrom Air Force Base. Ross, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the Chinese balloon that was picked up in Montana was in the vicinity of the Malmstrom Air Force Base. It right? certainly flew over that area, and I don't think it's yeah. any coincidence because apparently this Chinese balloon was maneuverable. There's claims now that it had propellers or some kind right. of propulsion system. Isn't it funny, though? I mean, isn't it hilarious that that so much media energy and attention in the last week has been directed at these balloons that, frankly, it's quite obvious now the Pentagon was caught napping on. The only reason now, belatedly, that they've acknowledged they've come from China is, I think, and this is what Mellon suggests as well, they've retroactively gone back through their data and realised that their filtering system excluded these from warning systems. And when they've looked, they've seen that their systems have picked up this anomalous balloon coming through their air space. And because they're so focused on ICBMs and cruise missiles, for good reason, for good reason, they're not picking up these UAPs. And if only the same level of attention was given to the spheres that are being seen by military pilots off the West and East Coast, and also, my friend, let's mention our friends Corbell and Knapp again, because they've had a splendid month. They had incredible vision in one of their earlier episodes of their podcast about the so-called Mosul Orb, which is right. a stunning photograph of what looks like a metallic orb hovering over a war zone, the city of Mosul in northern Iraq in 2016, taken by an American spy plane and part of the original classified briefing given to congressmen and US government officials by the UAP task force. It's only a still frame, but what it shows is quite significant. It shows a metallic sphere that, oh gosh, my friend, <laughs> seems to bear a resemblance to something else we've shown in Let recent shows. Let me think for a minute here. <laughs> Wait a minute. Is that the thing that you reported on in your uh, Channel 7 documentary? Funny you should say, my friend. Boy, uh, I have been overwhelmed. <laughs> one with critics giving me a hard time for telling that story. And then because I've known things like this are coming um, and there's more to come, I'm taking the Sphere's story very, very seriously indeed.
I, I do think that there is a phenomena which is being recorded on video and on still photography by military all over the world, including in my country, where metallic spherical orbs are coming up right close to military craft and literally manifesting themselves, allowing themselves to be photographed and seen in increasing frequency. And the fascinating thing in great uh, analysis done by our friend Christopher Sharp from Liberation Times is he pointed out that um, from his sources, the object had no apparent flight surfaces, no discernible propulsion, uh, an intelligence source with operational knowledge of the footage, he says, said it was filmed using a full motion video, meaning it also captured infrared and other data. And so they, they can't see any visible heat source that's driving this object. And more importantly, um, both Chris and others have told me, uh, I'm, I'm aware of sources in the intelligence community as well who've got in my ear that these spheres, these metallic objects, have been reported many times by US military and Australian military pilots over the Middle East. It's a very interesting thing that, um, as Chris has reported previously, drones might be operating 25,000 feet up in the air, and all of a sudden, an operator will see a little orb go flying through the viewfinder. Now, this is the sort of stuff that, frankly, well, the mainstream media is being willfully blind to and allowing the public to be completely misled with the notion that they're either Chinese drones or Chinese balloons. Believe me, mate, if the Chinese had technology such as that which is being described by military pilots who are speaking to people like Ryan Graves, Jeremy Corbell, mm -hmm. George Knapp, and on a more guarded basis to me because I'm a foreigner, um, if this was really Chinese technology, don't you think China or Russia would have used this technology by now? This is the ridiculous thing behind all of this. Use it. We'd be in a world of trouble. Listen, I just want to ask you, you have laid eyes on one of something that may be what that is. Um, the so-called bets balls that you looked at, were they about the size of a basketball, would you say? <laughs> Well, there's different sizes. I mean, we know from, I mean, I've, I, I'm now aware of seven people around the world who've got possession of these metallic balls. And we're not saying they're alien. I know I can just hear the skeptics going, oh gosh, they're, they're now saying they're alien. They're now saying they're ET. We are not. No. All we're saying is that this is a mystery and that these well, objects require investigation. It's and a that's mystery. what's being done. Let's think about something. Okay, here is a metallic sphere you know, not so big. It's round, it's metallic, and it's out there at 25,000 feet flying around very fast. How does that happen? Does anybody know anything currently that's doing anything like that? I don't. No, so no, but don't look over there. Look at the Chinese balloons. No, no, no. Don't look at the spheres. Look at the Chinese balloons, Bryce. Seriously, I'm uh, sorry if I made it clear. We should not be looking at the spheres, Bryce. We should be looking at the Chinese balloons or the Chinese drones. Yeah, listen, it's a magician's trick, and they're still trying it. But I want to know what those spheres are. They're very, uh, they're obviously physical objects. You've seen them, at least some of them. You know, we've heard about others, and now we've got photographs of them actually in flight. Uh, I think it's time that we focus a little bit of our, our attention on that. And that's where I kind of wonder, all right, if I'm on the Senate Intelligence Committee and I'm getting classified briefings and all that, don't you think they'd want to know what those things are too? And maybe they do. Maybe they're oh, so no, highly no. classified. We don't no, know. No, no. Chinese balloons, Bryce. Chinese balloons. Seriously. Who, who gives a fuck about bloody, what are they? Ch spheres. Seriously. I mean, yes. Chinese balloons. Yeah. China. China. <laughs> I mean, I it's just ridiculous. To give a shout out to uh, the name of the witness uh, uh, th that saw the um, the overflight at the near the nuclear plant. What was that man's name again? Nick Shaw. Nick Shore. I want to thank Nick Shore for letting us use his name. I think that's an important thing. Uh, I do believe that transparency is something we all aspire to. Uh, clearly, when you're doing investigative journalism, there are times where you have to protect sources. And that seems to be semi-different. I think what we have to do here is when people are willing to step forward and put aside the, the potential stigma that has always covered the subject, we need to give them a big round of applause. And I say to Nick, thank you. And I hope that other people, when they come forward, will in fact use their names, uh, do the best they can to record uh, what they have seen uh, and do it contemporaneously and do it in detail. 
uh, and, and write it down and, and share it because that's how we get data. And the more data you get, the more you start to see the uh, outlines of what this mystery really is. And again, as Ross said, we're not saying that we know exactly what this is. We are saying, however, that it is a mystery. It's a big mystery. And some of the things that are coming uh, from the Department of Defense currently don't seem like they're taking it very seriously. And I'm not sure why. And I think they should. The other big deal in uh, the last couple of weeks, Bryce, has been the fact that Jay Stratton, the mm. former head of the Pentagon's UFO program, the, essentially Lou Elizondo's boss at one stage, uh, has come out of the shadows. And he's spoken uh, publicly about his work. Basically, uh, he's the only guy who's worked across both the Advanced Aerospace Weapon Systems Application Program, OSAP, ATIP, the Advanced Aerial Threats Identification Program, the UAPTF, and also ARO, the um, uh, existing Pentagon body investigating UAPs. And this is a guy who's a very, very senior career intelligence agent, basically telling, now working in private um, uh, aerospace with a company called Radiance Technologies in Huntsville, right. Alabama. He's basically saying, the mere fact, I mean, he didn't actually say a huge amount in his interview with George Knapp, but basically what he did say was significant for the simple fact that he was basically acknowledging that there is a reality there to the UAP mystery that is worthy of investigation. And just to underline what you were just saying, he was really emphasizing the importance of data, the importance yeah. of collecting good, reliable data on the phenomenon. And you know, it really does behove the Congress now to start putting pressure on the Pentagon now that we've seen this appalling national security lapse where they were caught napping with a balloon flying over their aerospace. It really does emphasize the importance of looking at anomalous aerial phenomena. And this is what Jade Stratton was telling. Uh, you know, he was basically saying that there has been a Pentagon problem where there were people of extreme religious beliefs inside the Pentagon who felt that the study of UAPs was satanic or demonic. And, and basically, he knows that this attitude still exists among some, but he basically says they're the old guard. And he suggests yeah, right. that things are changing in the Pentagon. I was actually really heartened by Jay's interview. He didn't say a huge amount in this first appearance, but I suspect there's more to come. But the mere fact of his appearing is momentous. It's quite significant to see somebody like him coming forward and acknowledging the reality and poo-pooing the explanations of drones or balloons as a sufficient explanation for what's being seen off the west and east coast of America. I I really enjoyed hearing from him, although I have to say he was he was guarded. Uh, I think that would be a fair way to describe what he was saying, uh, because clearly there's some things he can't say. But what what really got to me is he was Lou Elizondo's boss. Right. And I just would ask people who are familiar with this subject and have heard Lou Elizondo uh, in his many interviews. OK. Lou Elizondo has said, said some things that you may think are shocking or crazy or way out there, but he said them repeatedly, uh, talking about crash wreckage and his belief in it and things like that. So if this guy was his boss, he knows all that and even more. And uh, I, I, I hope that you are right. I hope that uh, he will be talking more. And if he's not talking more to us, I hope he's telling senators what he knows and and uh, and moving this uh closer down the field so we can we can get some real answers but yeah a lot of things going on and i just wanted i we're getting to the end so i just want to put one thing out there in our uh, two uh podcasts ago we said we each read a letter ross read a letter that uh, someone had written him and i read a letter that i had gotten during the dark skies series and we were going to explain them more uh we've run out of time we are going to get to that in a future episode, but this time we just thought we had to get back on the um, on the playing field and and try to get some stuff out there. So yeah, we'll be back with all of that in the future. Yeah, I have to say, if if the current pace of in interesting news on the UAP issue in 2023 continues, this is going to be a momentous year. I mean, just last weekend, I was a guest at the Limina inaugural symposium on UAPs that was run by the Society for UAP Studies. 
And it was a very interesting event because it was attended by so many high-powered academics from all around the world who refreshingly were engaging with the UAP topic with seriousness and not ridicule. And the other thing that I want to put on record as well is full marks to Scientific American, one of the greatest scientific journals in the world. They made a half-decent stab this week at the UAP issue, acknowledging the importance in an article of proper data collection. Things are changing, Bryce. There's a real mood change going on, and I think we're all waiting to see now what comes up in Congress. You know, I like data as much as the next person, but I also like history. I like the history that shows that this so-called data that we're getting right now has happened before and and continually has happened over now eight decades. Uh, final thing to close on, you talked about that symposium you were at. Just so people uh, know, um, I'm going to be speaking at the con uh, the Contact in the Desert um conference in June and also at the Roswell Festival in July. And uh, I'll try to bring something fresh and original to both of those speeches. So we'll uh, look forward to that. So hang on, everybody. I think 2023 is going to be a very momentous and rocky ride, but it's an exciting time in covering the UAP issue because frankly, nobody else is. The legacy media as we've recorded here, are completely failing to do their job. And I think as we've explained today, you, the public, need to be asking why. Because we need to know. Roscoe, let's get out of here. See you later, <laughs> See everybody. You later, we can handle the truth. People get ready. <laughs>